Well, fall is here and the Epic Garden and the Epic Homestead are undergoing a transformation. You can see behind me, there's actually quite a bit still growing. We have some squash, but in front of me, we have a ton of trays and it's time to start some fall seeds. So I figured what I would do is just kind of hang out with you guys. Maybe it's a good time to pause the video, go grab your seed collection and get started. So I'm really excited. Let's just hop on over and get into it. I'll start talking about some of the things that I am growing. So here we go. We're gonna start off with some snow peas. <laughs> Why are you always here? I can't believe this. Why are you always like, here is the thing. I, I heard that we were gonna start seeds. I didn't come in here. You didn't hear it. Again. You didn't hear it because I didn't invite you. I mean, I saw the it's the thing. I saw the tray. I, d I didn't invite you. Well, <laughs> look, he's look, here. I got my stuff. Yeah. I'm like basically ready to go. Honestly, so and, and kick me out. here's the thing, it's like, kind of awkward. looks a little similar to my seed setup. <laughs> I, mean, I don't know where you got that idea I'm not from. Lie. But. I did steal it. <laughs> <laughs> All right, guys, Jacques the Garden Hermit is here. We're celebrating the very first video that went up on his channel, which is called Jacques in the Garden. So go check that out. But yeah, I mean, dude, we have a lot to start seeds for here. And also at your place, you had a little bit of an, an a little oopsie, right? <laughs> yeah, I had a, basically a, a bunch of rude caterpillars came in and uh, kind of ate my entire seed tray, so. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, watch pot never boils type of thing. I don't know, yeah. maybe you should have watched it a little more. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, so I actually started some yesterday. So while Jacques gets started with his set, I'll talk about some of the things that I got going. Really, if you're in a climate where you can start seeds right now, I recommend popping it out and doing it with us. It's kind of a chill thing to do. So what I started were a couple new varieties of peas that I haven't grown before. One that I have, which is the Desiree Dwarf Blauschocker. We'll put all these up on the screen, but three that I hadn't. So organic green arrow shelling pea. <clears throat> Usually I grow a snap or a snow pea. So that'll be kind of interesting. I've got the row seven. Oh yeah. So row seven is pretty well known for just testing a bunch of different things out. So a lot of the seeds they sell on the seed pack itself, it says experimental. So we'll see how that goes. That's a snow pea. And then, um, I mean, this is a sugar snap pea. It's pretty standard. Classic, yeah. yeah, it's classic. So I, I, I sewed about uh, actually half a tray's worth of that. So each of these trays are six cells in these Epic six cell trays, but 12 fit perfectly in a 1020 tray, which means it's back to a normal 72 cell tray. So we got 72, so half of those, 36, 36 piece. Enough math, let's actually just <laughs> get back into it. <laughs> so uh, the other things that I started yesterday, fall is a great time to do anything in the Braska family, which maybe Jacques, you can share some stuff you've yeah. experienced with Braska, but I have had some struggles with it. Uh, we, we all know if you watch the Epic Gardening Instagram, San, San Juan Capistrano this year, pour one out for, for that guy because <laughs> he really struggled. He got destroyed by cabbage worms and just the heat. But uh, you know, I, I planted a couple things here. So I got champion collards. I have a Romanesco cauliflower. I have premier kale. I have Steve's tender early broccoli, which for us, I think might be a really good choice because it gets done quick, which for us is a challenge because the heat can mess with uh, your, your brassicas. I have Waltham broccoli and then I have early rapini, another early variety. Most of them are coming from our friend Brigitte over at San Diego Seed Company, which I highly recommend. Her germ rates are really, really high. She just puts like her heart and soul into it. Yeah, I'm so, actually excited for some of those too. Yeah, I mean, for we, we may have popped by the warehouse and, and grabbed a little shopping spree. So what are you doing? So I, I, so, I just said what I'm doing. I, the only other thing I think I planted was, looks like some oh, Brussels yeah. and some uh, snowball cauliflower. Yeah. Yeah, so I'll tell you one thing I'm not gonna plant here. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't know why they only give me kohlrabi for free, but. Uh, you know why? So. <laughs> because no one wants it, because it doesn't sell. That's so I'll why. I'll tell you what, I, I grew it last year, yeah. even though I heard everyone say, what's the point? Yeah. I'm like, you know what, I'll, I'll try it out. Yeah. You know, maybe it's really good and everyone was just clowning on it. But it's basically just broccoli stem. Yeah. So I'm gonna pass on yeah. that one. Well, I'll say this, you know, when you, when you sign up for those farm boxes that people have. Yeah, the CSAs. It's like, sometimes it's like 42% kohlrabi. <laughs> And everyone's like, why would I subscribe to this anymore? I don't know what I'm supposed to do with it. Yeah, I know some of you probably say, oh, there's a million things to do with kohlrabi. Sure, but there's like 7 million things to do with other plants. So that's <laughs> yeah, what I think. Yeah, so I mean, on that note, I have yeah. three different, so I already kind of overstocked from uh, Johnny's last year. So yeah. I tried to go a little easy at uh, the San Diego Seed Warehouse. Yeah. But basically I'm gonna get some rapini growing. That's like a really nice sauteable kind of broccoli. Thin stems, it's almost like one florette on a stem. Right, basically. it's like a yeah. broccolini. Yeah. So you eat a lot more of the greens. Yeah. Um, and then I actually have a broccolini, 
um, a broccoli that's supposed to do well in high heat, mm -hmm. and um, some Bulgarian cabbage. I actually picked up while I was in oh, Bulgaria. Oh, did you smuggle? I mean, like, let's just say it was in the suitcase. Um, On accident. And as far as I know, that's sometimes okay. So. <laughs> well, I'll tell you this. When I got back from Barcelona, I smuggled a pregnant onion back. <laughs> yeah, I don't even know what that means. It's, orna it's ornamental. It's ornamental. Okay. I found it on a rooftop, <laughs> okay. and I and I just oops fell in my boot, you know. And uh, yeah, I mean I, I I grew it out. It's it's like a tiny little uh, ornamental allium that they uh, kind of like okay. they kind of gets really fat. Oh, but, and then it just has an ornamental stock. Okay. You know, little oopsie, I mean, but sometimes that happens. No big deal. It just falls in your yeah. <laughs> suitcase. Yeah. So you got that going on. I'm gonna be doing a lot of flowers. In fall, I'm gonna see what works because we're, we're scheduled to have a pretty hot fall. We actually had a little bit of clouds lately, but I don't think that's gonna continue because Jacques, you're just saying that we had a Santa Ana come yeah, through. Yeah, we're starting today basically and into the weekend, it's gonna be hot. So we're probably gonna keep all this in the shade until it germs. If you're not a native San Diegan or Southern Californian, what is a Santa Ana? Describe it for everyone. Um, Santa Ana is where you have like this climate system where in the Great Basin, so like Nevada area, all that pressure and really hot, dry air basically pushes towards the coast. So usually what we get is a coastal breeze, which is nice and cool. Mm -hmm. But during a Santa Ana, it's basically the reverse. You get all the hot desert air just blowing through San Diego out into the ocean. Yeah. So it gets really hot and it gets really dry. Like humidity drops by like 50%. So yeah, it's it, a pretty drastic difference. It feels like you're living in the desert, Yeah. you know? Um, and it, it's gnarly if you have allergies, which both of us struggle sometimes with allergies. Actually, I'm feeling a little tickle right now. Yeah. Not not staged, just I've been sneezing like crazy all day today. I'll vouch on that. Yeah, yeah, I've been sneezing. So um, yeah, it's, it's pretty gnarly. But anyways, what I'm saying here is that I'm putting in some flowers that should play well, whether it is fall or a hot fall, I suppose. So for example, I'm just doing calendula right now. This is Pacific Beauty. This plays in a cool or warm season. But yeah, I mean, I've been really, really wanting to expand my flower palette and have done so a little bit this year. But actually, we just had a really fun conversation with a few people on the podcast. And I was telling you earlier about how yeah. we're going big on bulbs, hopefully, which is not really a Southern Californian thing. You know, a warm zone, it's like Northeast. Yeah, it's usually something I don't... English about. garden, you know. But I had a conversation and there's this thing called a Stinson garden which is a, a Dutch thing, which is basically like planting tons and tons of bulbs in one place mm. and sort of letting them naturalize and letting them become part of that landscape. Oh, I um, see, so you just leave it. So you leave it. Yeah, oh, you, don't, okay. you don't necessarily dig it back up. I mean, maybe we'll have to because of our climate, hmm. but um, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm excited to do that. But just aside from that, I mean, I, I'm not planting bulbs right now, so I'm, I'm planting just a bunch of sort of random things that I think might look really nice. Yeah, I'll say that I, I grew that exact uh, calendula from San Diego seed last year. Yeah. And it was, I think, my favorite flower last year. Was it? It did really well throughout the winter. Yeah. And it had really, like, wonderful color. I would say from... And the tea's pretty good. Oh, did you have it? Out there, yeah. I had it once. It was, it was, um... I mean, it was good. I wouldn't say it was like stellar, but maybe yeah. I didn't. Maybe I didn't give it enough of yeah, credit. Yeah, mix it with like Tulsi, and it yeah. just kind of really pleasant, honestly. Okay, so I'm going in now with Alaskan nasturtium. So we, we we've done nasturtium on the channel quite a few times. I talk about it a lot, actually. I've done it on the podcast. But uh, what's interesting about the Alaskan mix is it's a variegated variety. So the leaves go from you know a, a cream white to just the standard green and it, it looks really cool, honestly. Yeah, I think it has um, some different colors on it too, mm -hmm. which is pretty interesting. Yeah, I would, I mean, nasturtiums, they are edible. I certainly don't like the taste. Like I really, actually, I would go as far as to say I hate the taste. <laughs> yeah. I hate it. Um, and, uh, so I'm not, you're not gonna find me eating them. <laughs> However, uh, you will find me growing quite a bit of them, I think, just because I, I love their, ooh, Hold on, I got distracted. <laughs> uh -oh. Polka dot mix corn, corn flour. That looks really nice. Also known as bachelor button, which is an edible, if you want it to be. I would call it more edible decorative. Like you're, uh, you're probably okay. not gonna. It's one I usually don't eat very often, but I think I've had it now that you mention it. You would like, I mean, one great way to do it is if you have like a little glass of, a little champagne, Ooh. a little, little oh, glass man. of that bubbly. <laughs> you, you can just put a couple of these in there and just spices it up. Yeah, I think I've seen that when people make those Pretty butters. 
Oh you know, like yeah, like a, a like a flowered flowered, flowered butter yeah. or whatever. Yeah. Who knows? Maybe that's coming soon. I'd like to make a little herbed butter. Yeah, a little pasture back here. <laughs> a little, little, little grazer, <laughs> a, little, a couple grazers out here. Yeah. So yeah, I'm for the way I'm gonna seed these is I'm gonna just sprinkle on top, and then kind of tamp them down. Yeah. And then at the end, I'm gonna come back through and just sprinkle soil over everything and then yeah. water it. I'm doing a slightly. So I'm not doing it how I used to do it, where I would poke a hole and then cover up with the soil that's yeah. there. I'm, I'm lightly tamping with the back of this marker, just tiny, just so it has a place to sit. And then I'm gonna do exactly what Jacques's doing where I'm gonna come through and just fill that little hole. And to me, I, that, that should work. Yeah. E either one works. There's so many different ways to do it. I think it's not worth getting hung up on. Well, people get, you know. Yeah, people definitely. <laughs> people kind of like lose it based yeah. on how you do it. And I'm like, okay, well, if the plant's growing, Problem solved. Yeah. Right. We're, we're not all trying to be like commercial growers out here. Right. And I feel like for like the brassica seeds are just. I mean, you can't even see them if I hold them up. They're just tiny little. Spheres. Yeah. They're, they're, they're yeah. So there's for that. I just usually don't bother trying to do anything well, fancy. Brassica is such an easy germ. Yeah. It's it true. just sprouts like no one's business anyways. So it, it doesn't really even matter what you do right. with it. Yeah, and I'm gonna overseed a little bit. Like I think I'm putting two to three in each. Yeah, so, so somewhat similar here. I'm doing delphinium right now. I don't know if it's a big oh, yeah. fall move, but I guess we'll find out. I mean, we do know it doesn't like the heat. <laughs> yeah, so because we did we did plant it out in the front yard, and let's just say it had a moment in the sun, and that's it. <laughs> it didn't have it much a flash else. In the pan. It was a flash in the pan. I call it Icarus over there. It just didn't have a good time. Okay, so I just put in the Pacific Giant Delphinium. Name name makes me feel like it'll do well here. Yeah, I mean, we are in the right spot. We are in the right spot. So, okay, so now I've got Snapdragons. I haven't grown these before. I've never grown them either. But I like the look. Yeah. So, I mean, this is just, this is a full flower flat here, guys. If you love snaps, you'll want to grow this dwarf variety of the old garden favorite. I do love snaps. Oh, deer resistant as well. That's good to know. A Luckily, good, we don't have that problem. We don't have that, but oh wow, you these seeds are tiny, do. dude. Oh wow, those are tiny. They it's look, like they, they honestly look like um, caterpillar poop. <laughs> That's exactly what they look like. They look like a like a. Too soon. I just like, you know, yeah, I'm already yeah. dealing. With that. <laughs> I've seen just, so much. Just of give that. you some like, trauma, yeah, trauma flashbacks. A little bit. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> Well, I mean, we've all we've been both dealing yeah, with it. It's pretty. It's pretty bad. We've all been there. Yeah. All right. What's next on the agenda? Oh wow. I'm gonna do. I don't know if it shows up. Oh, is that a coated seed? It's coated. Yeah. Um, they're kind of sliding away, but basically yeah. they're tiny brassica seeds, and they look kind of silver. Yeah. Um, I don't remember it mentioning that. I don't either. Um, on this one. That's a real thing, though. I mean, so if you get a, tr so it's either treated or coated. Yeah. Or both. Yep. Uh. It, it works pretty well. I mean, I would say your germination goes way up when you get seeds like that. The problem is it's just way more expensive. Yeah, so uh, the typically. other one, um, so this year uh, for my celery and lettuce seed, I actually ordered pelleted seed. Yeah. And so usually they do that because when they're using like cedars, they want a nice consistent size, like when they're commercially growing a whole row. Mm -hmm. And it's actually really nice for the home grower too, because some of those seeds are so tiny that they're hard to control. Yeah. And so I really enjoyed that because it was really easy to just pop one seed in each cell instead of having to like. Yeah, sort it's pretty clutch. And uh, actually, someone was telling me, we did a video recently on germinating carrots on Instagram, and someone was saying actually what they do is they just use pelleted carrot seed, oh, uh, and th that's how they deal with it. Especially if they're a farmer, because yeah. if they're a farmer, they can put it into like a jang cedar exactly. or something, yeah. and they get perfect spacing, and they don't have to thin, and they don't have to worry about. Uh, the, Pretty ideal. With carrots, the problem is that after germination survival rate, if it dries out, and so they just don't even have to deal with that. Right. You know, which is great. That's the tricky part. Okay, so I just went in with anise hyssop, uh, which I, I believe I've purchased but not grown. Uh, and it has a little bit of a licorice flavor. You can use it as an herb. I haven't used it as an herb, but mm, I'm mostly, cool. yeah, I'm mostly interested in using it as like a bed filler and like a fragrance type of plant. Okay, I have a few more in this little deck here. So this, got... this year I also kind of splurged a little bit. Oh yeah? Got What'd some you... fancy- <laughs> Get a little treat? <laughs> little F1 seeds here. So oh. Hybrid, um, a purple and a um, like orange cauliflower. 
Okay. <laughs> They're like the most expensive seat packs I've bought. Talk to me about the price. Uh, and well, actually, first of all, let's talk about F1 hybrids because a lot of people may not know what that uh, means. Okay. Yeah. So there's some things. Um, so if they're just like an heirloom or even just open pollinated, it's basically a seed that if it goes to seed and you save that seed, it's gonna essentially grow almost exactly like the original plant. Right. There's a chance it could have pollinated with something else. Probably not. But probably not. Yeah. Um, so F1 means that, oops, they took two different plants and they got the pollen from one and pollinated like pollen A and pollinated plant B with pollen from plant A. Yeah. So what happens is- Cross pollinated. Get, yeah, cross pollinated. Yeah. So you get, a seed that's produced from that pollination that they forced. And so when you grow that plant, if it goes to seed, you're not gonna get the same plant. Yeah. It's basically like a one and done. So yeah. usually they're more expensive because A, they take more labor to actually produce. Yep. And B, you can't, it's almost like, I don't wanna say proprietary. Um, yeah. It, it's hard to recreate. Cause you don't, if you don't know the two parent plants, then nobody else can really make it. Yeah, it's not, I wouldn't say it's accurate to say proprietary. Yeah. It's definitely, basically what you're doing is, the genetics aren't stable when right. you do that. It would be like, and this, someone who is a genetic expert is gonna cringe at this, but like, you know, if you had a child with someone and then the child had a child with someone who was like somewhat close to you, I guess, mm -hmm. looking, of course it's not gonna look like you. It's not gonna be a clone to you, right. you know? And so the, what the F1 stands for, the one is the generation. And so when people are trying to create a new seed variety or a new cultivar, let's say of a tomato or something like that, typically you either only produce it as an F1 forever, and that's what Jacques is, is meaning basically, where right. you kind of have to go back to whoever made the variety because they have the parent plants and they're propagating out the parent line by cloning those out and continually crossing and crossing and crossing. And something, I don't know if I ever told you this, but when I went on that seed tour, I learned that these F1 hybrids only have a certain amount of life in them years-wise before the genetics of the parents clone-wise deteriorate enough that they actually can't do it anymore. Yeah, I've, And so you'll lose them over time. I've heard that that's actually happening to some of uh, Sun Gold, which is like one of the most popular yeah. tomatoes. Yeah. Um, there's been some rumors. Rumor mill, the rumor mill. Uh, the genetics are getting a little unstable and some people have been growing them and getting results that they did not expect. Interesting. So there's definitely a scramble to find a replacement for that one. Yeah. It's really actually- It's, it's one of the better yeah. cherry tomatoes, yeah. Okay, so while we were talking about that, I put in tall white alyssum, which you turned me onto this year as an interplant between tomatoes, yep. but the tall one, I don't think I've grown. And so hopefully this kind of just grows to like, I don't know, two by two feet or so and just fills in a nice area. And then I also planted Black Knight Scabiosa, which I did grow earlier this spring and actually was one of my favorite flowers. Really pretty flower, unique sort of shape to it. And we actually discovered that monarchs really like yeah. the Scabiosa out of anything else. They seem to flock to it as an adult. Of course, the larvae are gonna probably be on some native milkweed species. But yeah, it was, it was really cool and interesting to see that. Yeah, it's really nice structured flower. It looks really interesting. Totally. I've never grown those before either. Totally. So I'm gonna get some red Russian kale in. Okay. Um, I really always like red Russian and it seems to do pretty well here. And then yeah. this is one that I'm gonna keep Ooh, trying, nice. even though uh, I don't know if anyone's gonna like eating it, including myself, and that's a uh, escarole. Uh. Um, so I got, for some reason, I got really interested in growing escarole. Last year I grew some, but I waited too long, and it got into the summer, and it just really was too bitter. Just wasn't having it. Yeah, yeah. but I'm gonna try again. Um, it's one of those bitter Italian greens. Do you know why uh, it's sort of grouped with endive? It's like endive and escarole on like a seed list. It's always in the same spot. Yeah, I think that they're, I think they're both chicories. Mm. I'm not entirely sure if that's true, but they're, I think they're related. Yeah. They're both like a bitter Italian green. Yeah, they're sort so of like a weird. Flavor profile, they're like similar. Yeah, I do know I like endive. Yeah. Uh, I, I don't know that I've had much escarole to say. I think it's one of those things that you find less often. Yeah. And I heard this interview from like the, the seed breeder at Johnny's and he was talking about how like excited he was and I was like all right well if he's if he's excited maybe I should try That's, it. it's yeah it's a testimonial yeah this one I'm excited about this is Marvel of the Four Seasons lettuce oh, that one looks really good looks amazing we'll put a photo up like I, I've been saying but yeah it says <laughs> this is a great description listen to this Marvel of the Four Seasons might just be the sexiest lettuce around it's just as beautiful as it is tender 
and succulent. Whoa. This finely flavored green and red lettuce can be sown in the fall or spring in cold climates or all throughout cooler months. Okay. So okay. if you're ready to get a little, <laughs> a little risque, <laughs> That's a bold claim there, so. ready to get a little uh, aesthetic <laughs> over here. Yeah, well, lettuce, I mean, lettuce in zone 10B where we are, you basically just say no in the summer. I mean, you can't do it. So yeah. you, you could do it. It's just, you're gonna have to put it in the shade. It's gonna grow slower and it probably won't taste as good. So you kind of just wait it out. You go winter into spring, and then you go fall into winter on, on lettuce here in, in California. Yeah. So our shoulder seasons, as they call them here. Shoulder seasons, and we so. Don't have a true fall or a true exactly, winter. Exactly, exactly. But we do have some big shoulders. Yeah. <laughs> Getting ripped. <laughs> And I'm gonna throw a little uh, pak choy in. Okay. Uh, it's bow pak. I, yeah, so like we said, brassicas can be hard here just cause it's kind of warmer. Mm -hmm. So I tend to go with hybrids. Yeah. Um, just because they're often bred to have qualities that do well in like heat, for instance. I know a lot of people are like heirloom only until I'm, till I'm dead. Yeah. And it's like, I understand that in instinct for sure. Mm -hmm. um, but I also want to grow things that won't die here. Yeah. And so there's, there's stuff where like the hybridized version just almost looks and tastes very similar. Like there's, I was talking with some seed breeders and you know, the Cherokee purple, the famous yeah. Cherokee purple, there's a variety of seed breeders who have Cherokee something like Cherokee, this Cherokee, okay. that Cherokee star yeah. or whatever. And it's the same thing, except for that it has blight resistance and it's earlier, right? Or it has some sort of qualities like that. So, you know, everyone's got their own preference, but. I used to be if you're pretty having, into just heirlooms. Just heirlooms, yeah. Um, but things like powdery mildew, like this year, all my squash or the zucchini was all heirloom. Yeah. And then they got wrecked by powdery mildew. So for my second succession, I bought F1s that are resistant to powdery mildew, and so far they don't have any. Yeah, and, um, surprise, surprise. <laughs> I'm pretty excited about that. Yeah, no so kidding. So hopefully the taste is still the same. Usually yeah. the biggest compromise is flavor, which is what I'm going for. Yeah. Um, but you know, there, like Kevin said, like there are varieties like that Cherokee purple that should taste at relatively least the same. Similar. Yeah. So we'll see. Totally. All right, I had a little bit of an allergy attack, so I had to do something about that. <laughs> it was just crazy, but brought a little treat for you. <laughs> no, I'm fine, <if> I do. <laughs> yeah. Hey, it's the end of summer. To a good, to a good charged. season. Yeah, there you go. It was a pretty good season here. I have to say, a lot of failures. We actually talked about on the podcast recently. Jacques is going to become a semi-recurring guest on the Epic Gardening podcast. We're just going to kind of riff on what's working for us in the garden, and uh, we talked about our failures, our successes, and. You know, they were many of both. Yeah. Uh, actually, so which is fine. I think it's fine. I mean, you know, I messed the up. Best way to learn. I messed up squash this year. We both did actually. Yeah. Um, I messed up my brassica, my big, my big one. <laughs> you know, my my big boy, San Juan Cabbage Strano, the giant cabbage. Uh, we may actually start another giant cabbage and grow it through into the fall because that's actually the right time to grow it yeah, for us. Yeah, especially for a big one. Yeah, exactly. Because we'll push it through the winter because it doesn't get cold enough to kill it. And then when it comes out the other side in spring, it'll still be heading up, I think. I think and that's so gonna work. That should probably work. Okay, so I'm going in with the Allium family. What we're gonna be doing here in the backyard is doubling the space. And that requires a different method of approaching the garden. It's probably gonna be a little bit of row gardening on that side, almost like a little mini farm. And so I wanna grow a lot of alliums that I personally love, and one of my favorites actually is, I would say the least common, which would be a leek. I really, really like leeks. We actually have a couple started over here so you can get a sense of what they end up looking like. There's a couple in here, there's three clusters, maybe four in some of the other ones. And what's really nice about that is, as we learned from Charles Dowding, you can, you can just module sow as he calls it, but yeah. I mean, for me, I just I guess I would just call it putting more than one seed in the, in the thing, you know? Yeah. But um, anyways, it, that's what I'm gonna do. So I'm gonna plant quite a few leeks here. These are German leeks. This is from Renee's Garden Seeds. And I'm gonna plant at least, I don't know, I mean, half, I mean, a, half a flat worth probably. If you want. I, I want a lot of leeks. My, one of my favorite things, I'm getting to the point, dude, where I can almost grow my own PLS, potato leek soup. <laughs> So he's on an acronym basis. What, that one. Uh, yeah, I, w PLS and I, <laughs> you know, we've become acquainted over the years. I've developed a recipe I like. Maybe it'll be on an episode of Kev's Kitchen here soon. Kev's Kitchen. 
you know, I'm surprised you haven't seen the playlist. I mean, it's on it's on the channel, it's Jacques. Good. It's on the channel. It's pretty good. All I've done, I've made um, cowboy candy oh, with yeah. the jalapenos. But anyways, yeah, I'm getting to the point where I can grow my own soup. So I've processed my own wheat. We're gonna make a sourdough bread on, uh, on this channel soon. Yeah. But yeah, we're getting to that point. So with, with leeks, what's great is, like I was just saying, you can over sow to guarantee germination, but also just, you're gonna, you're gonna use more than one of them anyways. Yeah, I feel like for the alliums, it's generally a good move. Yeah. Because their roots are so, they're not very like serious roots. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. it's they're really easy to just kind of pull them out mm -hmm. and just separate them and then plant them. Like, yeah, totally. You don't need to dedicate one cell with one plant. Totally agree. If you're going to do it this way, because of course you could just direct sow. Yeah, of course. Right? Yeah. Okay, so German leeks is going to be this entire side, so that's going to be 36 of those. And then the question is, what's my onion going to be? I have three choices here. Yellow Granex, Gold Coin, which Brigitte at San Diego Seed says is like really, really good. Oh, okay. Um, that's the only one I didn't grab, and I was like, dang, why didn't so I grab that? So Gold Coin is a flat yellow Cipollini style. You can grow it as a pearl or a small bulb when it's 80 days. Okay, so that's one choice. The next choice is the Red Rock, Saboya Roja. Minnesota, well, that one. So he's gonna do that one. That one, ideal for southern growers, short day onion. Hmm. Yeah, growers in zones nine and 10 can plant these in the fall and let them over winter, which is exactly what we're doing. So it, a lot of the stuff you, you see on our channel, guys, you have to remember, just adapt it to your zone. There's some weird rules. It's almost, it's, not, it's almost not like we're breaking these rules. It's like we can't grow it another way. You know, there's not another way to grow it. Yeah. Um, and so I'm gonna do half on this red rock. And this one's 165 days. So where we plant this in the garden is gonna, like we need to make sure it's half a year. Yeah. So we need to make sure it's in the right spot. Actually one of the things I really like about the alliums yeah. is that they require almost nothing. Like mm -hmm. they don't really want a lot of nutrients. They don't need a lot of water. And you just kind of put them in there and wait. So mm -hmm. it's like a nice way to have like a productive bed without much fuss. And in the end you get like a huge bumper harvest. It's like really nice. Totally agree, yeah. Yeah, if you get them right, you you get just an incredible harvest and they'll, they'll store for a bit. Yeah, I'm actually eating through I finished like the first three varieties of garlic I harvested. Nice. And now I'm on to like the the last one, which is Susanville. I think that one stores for like nine months. So yep. I've been waiting. Smart. So that one I'm uh, about to break into. So I'm ready for some more garlic, that's for sure. Yeah. Yeah, the garlic you won't see us planting today. Yeah. Although it is on the way. We got a, a couple, well, <clears throat> why, don't you, why don't you share the varieties you got? I'll, then I'll drop the hammer <laughs> on the ones I got. I <laughs> so don't even remember which ones I got. I know I got, like the Inchellium red again. Mm -hmm. um, I got, uh, man, what is it called? It's like Rosa de Sol. I can't even say it. It's yeah. an Italian variety. Italian. Apparently, it's so good. Yeah. You only need one clove for a dish. So, so it says? It. Is that what it says? That's what they claim. Hmm. They say you only need 52 um, heads of garlic and you're set for the year. You just need one clove a day. That's, to me, you know what? And this is just my hot take. <laughs> That feels like an Italian thing to say. It feels, cause you know, like with cooking especially, and I love, actually there's a, a guy I chat with sometimes on IG, Fabio, oh, okay. uh, who's a, he's like a celebrity chef and he's like this. He's, you know, oh, they, really? there's always a proclamation about the food. <laughs> there's always like a way it has to be some done. Rule. Some sort of like, you know, like you only need one for a, a month of, you know, whatever. Yeah, but they, they I'm excited. If it's rules. if it's true, I'm I'm down to yeah, I'm down sure. to grow it. I'm also gonna go pretty big on the leeks here. Are you really? Are you? Oh, look at this guy. So, got look at this. <laughs> <laughs> He's growing the Bulgarian giant. Yeah, that's from Baker Creek. You didn't smuggle that. So I actually did smuggle one, and I thought it was in here, but I guess I didn't put it in here. Wow. So okay. So I'm gonna well. go ahead and sew this one. A little bit of a fail. Uh, yeah, it's a little awkward. <laughs> <laughs> I also got some of those exact San Diego seed onions. Yeah. Um, and I also apparently didn't put them in this box. Really? So well, you could use these if you want. Yeah, you can. So I've exhausted two of my trays worth of seeds. So I'm gonna do what I said earlier. I'm just gonna take a little bit of seed starting mix and just lightly sort of dust over them. And then Jacques, you're doing your onions, uh, I would say similar, but just a little bit different. Yeah. So why don't you show that? So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna just get a little pot and then inside I just put soil, like kind of maybe half an inch down and I flattened it. So I gave it like a really nice tamp. And what I'm gonna do is basically 
sprinkle somewhere like 20 seeds maybe perhaps in there and the idea is that like I was saying earlier with onions is you don't need that much space initially um, so once those all grow I'm just gonna dump the pot out and then separate out each individual plant and then plant them that way so it's almost like a bare root like basically like a bare root tree yeah basically it's, it's just really forgiving with onions because their roots don't tangle and it's really easy to just kind of yeah. pull them apart and yeah. just plop them in the ground it feels like they just grow straight down <clears throat> You know, yeah, exactly. Very vertical. And um, the other nice thing actually is that for things like leeks, so you know how when you buy a leek, it has that white portion at the bottom? Mm -hmm. The only way you get that is if it doesn't get hit by sun. Mm -hmm. So one of the things that people do is when they transplant their leeks, like let's say your leek is like, you know, 10 inches tall. Sure. You make a let's hole. Let's grab one actually. Yeah, we have one right here. Why don't, the, you do, why don't you do it with one of these? Yeah. yeah. Or one of the other. I think this was the the garlic leek or whatever. Oh, right. This guy, right? Yeah. Yeah, there you go. So the nice yeah, That's thing. actually the German leek that I sewed. Oh, so it's yeah. a great example. So like, actually, I'll just pop it right out. Yeah. So I'm going to get up right here. So what I'm going to do is just pop that. You can see that like it's already just crumbling. And don't worry, I'm going to just put this in a pot. So yeah. It's going to keep growing. But so here we go. Got four leek plants, and these were actually just all right on top of each other. Mm -hmm. And even even considering that, it's still so easy to just grab the yeah. whole plant right out. And how? So here's a question someone's gonna have: Is how do you then get this into its home without cramping the style of the roots? Because that's actually a perfect root structure. Yeah, it's actually. So you don't want to mess it up. And and so the thing is, is that what commercial growers do is they'll just make a hole, like so. I'm actually. What you would want to do is bury like six inches of the leek. Mm -hmm. so you would make a hole and just literally go like this, just drop it in. Mm -hmm. And some people do cover it with dirt again, some people don't, and it'll grow just fine. And how much worry do you think someone needs to have about, oh, it's like tangled at the bottom or something's weird? It's fine. Not a They're big gonna, deal. Like, since they, like, this is going to sit there and grow for at least three months. Yeah. So it's really going to just be fine. Um, that little initial start where you just drop it in, it might seem weird, but they're gonna be totally fine and that's what they do. So it's not something to really worry about. And the deeper you bury it, you don't wanna bury it like, maybe you could bury it like two thirds, mm -hmm. but basically every portion that you bury underground is now gonna be the white part of the leak, yeah. which is what people like to eat. And so guys, that's, it seems like it's something that you only do with leeks, but actually from like just a, I guess a horticultural point of view, mm -hmm. you're just blanching the plant. Right. Um, so basically all you're doing is saying, hey, this part of you doesn't get sun, thus what can it not develop? Chlorophyll, which is the pigment that turns it green. And so that's all you're doing with, with leeks. Actually, that same seed tour I was telling you about earlier, Jacques, yeah. they were doing a test, I believe with endive or escrow, I forgot oh, yeah, which yeah, one. Yeah. And what they would do is they would put a opaque bowl over it uh, for uh, however many days yeah, yeah, yeah. pre-harvest. And so that would uh, force it to be blanched. And so if it's a bitter green, it's a way to get the flavor of the endive or the escarole in a milder fashion. Um, and so I thought that was pretty cool. It is, yeah. They come up with all these like weird tricks. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and um, like for the leek, for instance, the part that is white, tends to be a lot more tender and not as fibrous. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of the reason why a lot of people like to do that. Yeah, and what's kind of weird is like, that's what people, you buy a big old leek and then that's the part you use and you don't use anything else. Yeah, right? I, what I usually do is I'll just chop up the greens and then just throw it in like a soup, like as if it's stock. Yeah. And you get a lot of flavor. And if you put it in like an instant pot or like a pressure cooker, yep. it actually does become tender. So yeah. I try to use it. You can definitely veggie stock it, worst case. Oh yeah, yeah. And it's gonna be delicious. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, potato leek soup, like I said. It's my, it's, <laughs> it's, so there, there's two <laughs> soups, there's actually three soups. I don't know if a chowder's a soup, is it? I mean, let's call it. Chowder's <laughs> like, chowder's like you, you half made a soup or you accidentally put too much liquid in a dish. Yeah. You know, like an entree, really yeah, yeah. Anyways, no one knows what chowder is <laughs> <laughs> to this day. But um, so the three things are really like salmon chowder. Oh, okay. And you use coconut milk instead of the dairy. Uh, I mean, honestly, yeah. I, I like the heavy cream in it too, personally, but um, mm. you don't have to. Can't go wrong. You can't go wrong. Uh, the thing that, so at one time I looked up what's the most nutritious green by just raw like weight, oh, you know, okay. like mineral, den mineral nutrient density by weight. And it's actually like, do you have a clue what it is? 
No. No? Like hazard a guess though. Is it like something you could buy at the grocery store? You could buy it at most stores. Hmm. I'm gonna say beet greens then. That's a pretty good guess. They're pretty high, but uh, actually it's watercress. Oh. Yeah, watercress. It's like something I never buy. You would never buy it. And so I was like, hmm, I've never bought watercress. <laughs> uh, and I actually try to grow it, but watercress is sort of like a riparian style plant. Yeah. Like it wants to grow by a river. And <laughs> I don't know if you guys know, but that's not present here. Uh, never will be. And so I picked up, I picked up watercress and I made a watercress soup where it's hyper heavy in watercress, obviously. And then I think it's like lemon, salt, pepper, uh, and then you do that like dollop of heavy cream to oh, like, and then yeah, you yeah. after the fact, you know, honestly, it might even be better than potato leek. Wow. So. All right. Well, it is. time you make it, you gotta it, yeah. maybe save me a bowl. I, I, I might, you know, I might leave one out by the porch for you. <laughs> <laughs> just put it out right outside the shed and yeah. I'll just pop out. Well, the thing is, what you guys don't know is, <laughs> well, you do know his name is the garden hermit. Now, what you don't know is the lore of a garden hermit, true. and I think you know it, right? I know a little bit. Why don't, why don't you share a little bit of your story? <laughs> <laughs> so back in the day, yeah. uh, this is a, a British thing, so yeah. I don't know if I, I know that, yeah. that well. None of us do if I it's mean, British. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a mystery. Yeah. Uh, but basically it's like people wanted to have gardens, but they didn't really want to take care of it. I guess. <laughs> um, and it was like a conversation. So, so royal. <laughs> kind of like a flex. It's yeah. like you come over and you're like, wow. Like this person's garden is crazy. Like, how do you do it? And then you're like, well, here, here's how. Yeah. And then there's a little cottage in the back. <laughs> and it's like a little thatch roof, you know, like stone, stone little cottage. And you know, I'll just roll out a yeah. little wooden door. Yeah. And uh, the role of the hermit is basically maintain the garden and provide entertainment for the guests. Yeah. So I mean. Yeah. I don't know. Let me know how I'm doing. Uh, so live that hermit life. I might move into the shed, but. Yeah. It gets a little hot. A couple people are convinced that's where you live. You actually live in the shed. Just but, uh, put out the garden straw. Yeah. Just kind of lay down on that. No, I saw, so I saw this garden hermit as like a meme. Yeah. Like someone posted it as a meme. It's like a goal. Yeah, it's like, this is like, honestly, why did this job ever go out of style? It's my life goal. And, and then I showed it to Jacques and he was like, it's kind of my vibe. It's kind of what I'm going. Yeah, he's like, he's like, I'm actually like really into that idea, <laughs> on every level, and so. I'm gonna grab. You, you need some here. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I need to figure out what I'm planning next. Oh, celery. So. Anyways, <laughs> we may or may not be building Jacques a Hermitage, out in the backyard, and he can, you know. Uh, maybe weekend. Putter around. <laughs> a little timeshare. Yeah, he's got a timeshare. <laughs> got timeshare in the back. All right, I'm going in with the. Parsleys, the celeries, the fennels, the dills, all, right. all that kind of stuff. Uh, and I'm gonna go big on the dill, actually. I, went, oh, yeah. I way underdid the dill this year yeah, in the spring. Same. I don't know why. I, I, I put dill out, and honestly, I think it was earwigs. Um, oh, yeah. Apparently, really like dill. Well, which, yeah. Uh, they like anything we like, which is unfortunate. Y yeah, you got a little, uh, you got a little worked up it's about the it's earwigs. It's kind of personal. Yeah. Like, Let's just say uh, I wanted some rapini last year. And I didn't get any. <laughs> like, uh, I walked out one night. And I was like, you know, I'll do a little night check. Yeah. You know, just see what's going on. Yeah. And um, lo and behold, there's like 300 earwig babies on every single. It was to the point where you rock. actually texted me. You were like, hey, That's, I can't handle this. I'm, I'm out. You were like, I'm, I'm actually going to see uh, therapy. <laughs> I'm going to therapy for this. It didn't help. No, and then I, yeah, I mean, and then I was like, because because really earwigs are. They are a natural decomposer in the garden, and they, and they do play a functional role, of course. Every organism has an actual purpose, so to speak, in, in the ecosystem until the populations get out of balance. And uh, let's just say it was out of balance this year. <laughs> yeah. I mean, we were, when we were doing the, the epic fence that you guys saw, we would lay out those boards that we were staining, and then the earwigs would freaking, so we, we lay, lay, lay them out back there, like vertically up, right? And just kind of stack them, ladder them. And then we, we'd get up the next day to get back to staining them. And you'd pull a board away and like 400 earwigs would be at the top. Like literally. At, in the crevice at the top. And they'd, and they'd go, ah, and they'd all like fall like a cloud. <laughs> and the first time you did it, you got a little mad. I got a little mad. You got a little mad. I was like, what are you guys even doing? Yeah. Here? Like, there's no, nothing sacred anymore. It made me mad. Yeah, it made me mad too, because I was like, of all places, why there? Yeah. You know, exactly. why there? 
Like, there's so many options. Like, yeah. You're gonna just go anywhere we're going. Mm -hmm. It's kind of rude, basically. Kind of rude. I'm just a little upset. So what did you do in your garden to prevent them anyways? You found I mean, a decent solution. So the first thing I did is just try to remove like some leaf piles and stuff and just hope that they would go with the leaves. Yeah. Um, the other thing, uh, Sluggo Plus, I usually try not to use stuff like this. Yeah. But the population, like you said, was basically out of control. Nothing was eating it. Mm -hmm. So there wasn't any balance. So anywhere where I had, like, I didn't put it everywhere, yeah. but basically anything that I saw that was getting wrecked, I put some. But ultimately what I did is I went entirely to transplants mm -hmm. because they usually seem to prefer the baby seedlings. Easy for them, I mean, they're tiny, yeah, right? They're so it's so easy for them easy. to get to. But like once the plants mature, even if the earwig eats it, it'll still keep growing. Yeah. So that was kind of how I got around it. Um, what I did is yeah. uh, I tried at least a similar thing where you clear the brush, right? Yeah. But, but I also tried uh, a, a variety of traps none of which worked extremely well, because like the beer trap works mostly for a slug. Yeah. And then there's like this potato trap where you cut a potato in half yeah. and then hollow it out. And that tends to work for the roly polies or the pill bugs. So it didn't really work that well. Um, but then I tried taking the neem cake fertilizer and just putting that in. Oh, yeah. And that muted it, but it didn't do anywhere near as well as, as the sluggo would have, I think. Yeah. By the way, I just put in the varieties I put in. So Long Island Mammoth Dill, that's a very big dill variety. Uh, I put in a celery that I have not grown yet. This is Golden Pascal. So it's a little bit lighter green. The back says a classic hardy celery that grows well in the warm winters of Southern California. So a, a lot of, obviously a lot of San Diego Seed Company seeds do really well in warmer climates. If you have a cold variety, you just can't seem to figure out how to grow, but they will work well anywhere. And I'm finally putting in uh, flat leaf parsley. It's funny because like as a kid, because you grew up here. Yeah. Yeah, so did you ever go to like diners? Just like a, like a Denny's or like a Coco's or anything like that? Not that regularly, but yeah, occasionally. That was like our treat out, you oh, know, yeah. was to like go to, not maybe not a Denny's, but like we'd go to like a Coco's or something. Right. And um, so that would be our treat. And there'd be, you know, you'd get like a breakfast, whatever, breakfast mm -hmm. slam at night. And there would always be parsley on the, on the plate oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. and I'd just be like what's this and I would you'd never eat it you'd never eat it <laughs> yeah. right like it, it was 100% a garnish and now that's just not the case like now people Are you into it? well I think I think everyone's into it more a little bit don't, don't, don't you like one of those like super healthy things mm -hmm. um, personally I remember as a kid not liking parsley because yeah my mom wouldn't cut it that finely <laughs> and I'd like get it and then I'd be like I'd be like Ugh. <laughs> like I'm joking. Wow. Uh, so there's a little scar there. His own mom is but, throwing, uh, her, throwing her under the bus. Yeah, I mean, maybe it was a strategy, <laughs> but. <laughs> well, I'll tell you this, and I know, and I know, and I know she's listening. Uh-oh. Because sometimes my mom will even transcribe these videos. Secret. I try to keep the epic mom, you know, in the company. But she, we were talking about Brussels sprouts. Oh, yeah. And I don't think it's a my mom thing. I think it's a 90s everyone thing. No one knew how to cook Brussels sprouts yeah, back it's then. it's so weird. I, Here's all a, of a sudden, <laughs> it was like, oh wow, these are delicious. It was, okay, so he, how how were they cooked in your in your home? I just never had Brussels sprouts. Okay, so <laughs> I don't, maybe I don't they were cooked once and never again, yeah, yeah. yeah. I don't know. Yeah, so, well, how they were cooked is there'd be like a pot with like a steamer basket. Yeah, I've heard about that. And then you'd freaking steam it, and then if you ran out of water, you're just heating it like in the air. And that would happen a lot. And it would get kind of like roasted and toasted, but like not in a good way. Yeah. And you'd be like, okay, well <laughs> this just tastes like garbage. Yeah. You and know, it smells and it's, like and garbage. it smells like garbage. And so I would sit there and be like, I'm not eating this. I'm not eating this. And I'd have to like go to my room if I didn't eat it. But sometimes I'd win, sometimes I'd lose where I'd sit there for like an hour, you know, and just yeah. not eat them. I think I'm going to grow early wonder beets. Oh yeah, that looks Try like those. interesting pickup. I have badger flame in here as well, but I don't want to grow them, so I'm not going to. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's what it comes down to. Yeah. Just only grow what you want to grow. I don't want to grow it, so. Honestly, the badger flame though, this spring, did they did do pretty well. Yeah. Yeah, I'm actually putting in an apple blossom snapdragon, just another snapdragon. Ooh. And falling in love, Poppy. Okay. okay. Uh, which, uh, right. it's like pinkish, reddish. <laughs> Um, I had limited success last year with poppies. The ones that made it, I was like so into. Like, uh, I think, like you said, getting into some of these flowers, like, mm. I think I get it now. Oh uh, yeah, just yeah. Because they add so much contrast and color, 
that I really do want to make a point of having. It's nachos worth. Here. It's worth. It's definitely worth. It's at first I was like, oh, I only want things that I'm going to eat. Yep. Um, but it's kind of silly, um, not just because of the aesthetics, but also it's just like a nice thing for bugs to have too, like beneficials. Totally. It's, it's all beneficial in the end. Yeah. Plus, it's like there's only so much you can eat. Yeah. I mean, that's a big one. <laughs> That's what I've noticed. And I could do a better job, right? But I, mean, I but, could eat a lot, but. <laughs> yeah. Oh wait, I already labeled this. Well, I'll put another one there. There you go. Okay. Now you can put it in two spots. Yeah, so I'm gonna top mine. This is gonna be my last tray for now. So yeah, I'm gonna top I'm mine off. Too. And then what we'll do is we'll do a little watering session and just get these, get these in a position where they could actually start to germinate. I think I'm somewhat sold on this method here, but I think there's probably a slightly smoother way to do this. Yeah. It's not, it, it works really well if like like the soil mix here it's um, doesn't have a lot of big stuff. Yeah. The seed starting mix. Yeah. And that's really the critical thing. You don't want to put like a big wood chip on top of your seeds. Right. Cut this. This is perfect timing with the sun. Yeah. Yeah. Let's do a let's take a photo. Okay. Of like yeah, all the seeds. We'll, we'll just we'll just we'll just do like a post oh, yeah. for the gram today. Keep it simple. I was gonna say for watering, uh, I like to use the mist. Setting. Yeah, yeah, me too. Yeah, I've got a couple tips too. Nice. All right, we're back in. So you got mostly onions in that in yeah, that row. Mostly onions, a couple flowers, and I'm gonna throw in a couple of these the fancy cauliflowers I was talking about earlier. Oh right, the. Uh, the so, cheddar, you, you grown cheddar? It's or? a similar variety to cheddar, yeah. I guess, that does a little bit better. And with cauliflower, I just don't want to mess around. Yeah, like, uh, me neither, me as neither. As soon as it gets hot here, it could just ruin your cauliflower. Instantly. And it's just really sad. It's just a, yeah, it's an emo <laughs> moment for yeah. sure, emo moment. I don't like it. I'm neither not, do I. I'm trying to relive that. No. I've relived, I've actually, I have relived it is the problem. I, I have relived it. Multiple lives. Mo mo I've, I've lived, you know. So, many failures of that. So. That's the bane of the Santa Ana's we talked about earlier is that we'll just be having a nice cool season and then all of a sudden three days, intense heat, dry, yeah. everything bolts. and then Which done. is exactly what just happened because we had the crazy rain recently. Yeah. First rain in six months, two cloudy days, and then this. Yeah. And it's like the plants are going to be like, oh, fall's coming. Oh, it's not. Yeah. And then you're just... It's, it's like getting juked out by Mother they Nature. Got, they got pump faked by Mother Nature, yeah. <laughs> Mother Gaia just turned its back on them. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so we're gonna move into watering now and all we need to do is just get our trays back up on here We want to kind of do it all at once. So let's organize this real quick Yeah, we have I don't even know how many seeds but each of these <laughs> is 72 so over 300 seeds started and remember like the leaks 18 sowings is probably more like triple that yeah. right? So tons and tons of seeds. Hopefully you've done the same as well Talk about a couple ways that you can moisten this first of all you can pre moisten so what you could have done when you were starting is just fill the bottom of these trays up if there's no drainage holes i give it maybe like half an inch or so yeah and what, yeah what's going to happen there is especially if you're using the epic six cell trays look how big the holes are right there you can see it it's going to suck the water straight up through the mix and so actually after i sow i like to do that I, yeah. I'll, I'll fill this up maybe i don't know a third or half of an inch right so i'll do it over here and then i'll do this on yours maybe sure so everyone can see it is we both seem to like to come through with the mist. Yeah. So it's, it's kind of the only time I use the mist. You just, get out of the splash zone. <laughs> you get out of the splash zone. <laughs> and you just come in and you just do this. Yeah. And it's it's really nice using the mist because it doesn't like disturb the soil as much. Yeah. But it does actually drop a surprisingly significant amount of water. Yeah. Yeah, because it like, you know, we just put some poppies in here, right? Right. So if I came through with the, if I came through with the shower. Yeah it actually would agitate those to the point where maybe they're not sitting they quite in the right spot. They could get or even washed out. Totally, yeah, so here, you hit yours. Yeah. But hopefully you guys really enjoyed this fall starting seeds with us video. I know it's a really long one, but the whole point was to kind of have you guys sit and chill with us, reminisce on the season, and get your, your fall garden going. So until next time, good luck in the garden. Oh, check out Jacques' new channel, Jacques in the Garden, and he'll have a full tour on soon. Yeah. Good luck in the garden and keep on growing.